In April of 2019, Valve News Network interviewed Gray Newell, son of Gabe Newell. Gray is the founder of his own game studio, was 21 at the time of the interview, and the focus of the 90-minute chat was on brain-computer interfacing, which is an exciting and scary new technology that companies are already experimenting with. Companies like Elon Musk's Neuralink, and another one you might have heard of called Valve, which Gray knows quite a lot about since it's run by his dad. Check out the full video in the description below. This video will provide a summary of what was covered, which might help prepare you for what was discussed in the full video, because there is a lot to take in. What is BCI? Brain-Computer Interfacing's goal is to read and write information directly to your brain. This bypasses primitive and limited input devices such as mice and keyboards, and hopes to combine the strengths of man and machine. Imagine the processing and computing power of a computer combined with the creativity and free will of a human being. The Matrix was brought up, and is a possibility with this technology, but from what I gathered, it has the potential to be even more than that, propelling those augmented with the technology towards the singularity while everybody else is left behind and unable to find jobs. Potentially. There's a chance that it could do great good or harm, but right now it's all up in the air as speculation. But the important thing is, we need to talk about it now. I got the impression that there is no limit to this technology. It can remedy brain damage, it can treat PTSD, it will enable better reflexes, control of drone swarms, it will transform every facet of life as we know it, leading us headfirst into a virtual reality where we become less and less reliant and constrained by our fleshy, blobby bodies. We will see what intelligence looks like once it's stripped of the mortal coil. His words, not mine. And those who don't have it will be left in the dust. In the interview, there was a lot of fear, doom and gloom about the technology, but despite that, Gray considers this technology to potentially be a net positive for humanity. But we need to decide now if it's the direction that we want to be heading in, and he thinks that we do need to talk about it. People need to know that this technology isn't just feasible, but that it's already being done, and that it's further ahead than you might think, especially since the interview is now almost two years old. What does BCI look like? Brain-computer interfaces can be performed either from outside your head or from inside. Inside would require an operation to install some kind of neural link. Obviously, this is far more intrusive than a system that just sits on top of your head, but it provides a stronger, more direct connection to your brain. He says the benefit of this is that it enables stuff to be done sooner. In other words, what can be done with a neural link directly to your brain will be possible without invasive procedures about 5-10 to 10 years later. But it sounds like, if you want to be on the cutting edge of this technology, you're going to want something installed inside your brain via medical procedure. What is being done with this technology right now? They can already help with autism to treat PTSD, disassociative identity disorder, concussion, and to help with sleep problems by using magnetic e-resonance therapy, which Gray himself has had, and he spends a large part of the interview talking about what it's like. He mentions several great success stories with the technology, like it enabling a severely autistic person to speak, or to help a veteran with PTSD to become the man he once was again. He describes the brain as being like a table with lots of springs stretched over it, which information travels across. Over time, due to wear and tear, concussions and drug use, these springs can get damaged or out of sync. Magnetic e-resonance treatment fine-tunes the frequencies of these individual springs, or even the entire table, to get the brain to function better. But how is this fine-tuning done? He later reveals that he goes to the Valve offices to have MER treatment done, and that it's a wildly casual process. After having a brain scan done, they showed him the EEG and told him it looked like he had a concussion and pointed out all sorts of peaks on the readings, identifying the symptoms he had been having. If you're tired all the time, for example, they can help with that. He then has a bunch of electrodes strapped to his forehead to read the brain activity and then to feed it back into the brain again, quite literally overclocking his brain to fine-tune its frequencies, and to make it more efficient. This is done in 9-second intervals, twice a minute, across 5 half-hour sessions a week. And each session ends with a chocolate milk for him being such a good boy. Plus the brain needs something because MER sessions are like a workout for it. When it's underway, he says he doesn't feel it, but that it has a calming effect on him. But then later says that it can be physically uncomfortable and can cause muscle spasms, and that it interrupted his sleep cycle for a while, although it can also be used to tackle sleep disorders. He says it's very safe, but that the person administering it could instantly induce a panic attack if they wanted to, and there's a 1 in 500,000 chance of seizures. He says that this should be available to the public within two years, which means about now. What's next? So stuff like this is already possible, but when and how will it reach your home? 
Gray speculates that it may take the form of a VR or AR headset, minus the screen. He speculates the Valve Index's successor may have the first components for brain-computer interfacing. Such a device would be a great opportunity for Valve to begin collecting massive amounts of information from players' brains as they play games, since it's such a controlled environment. Of course, this would be helped if Valve were to make some sort of game or experience for the Valve Index that everybody wanted to play. This interview was done back in 2019, before Half-Life Alex was announced. It sounds like he isn't told everything about what's happening, and doesn't wish to disclose some of the details that he does know, but he says that looking at Valve and how it's been transitioning from software to hardware, that it's clear to him that this is becoming an increasingly logical next step for them to make. Such brain scanning features might not even require a new device. He thinks that even the Valve Index could have a brain scanning feature added to it in the form of a hardware plugin. He doesn't know this, but thinks it's pretty obvious that this is the direction that things are headed. He gives an example of how brain-computer interfacing works. You show people a picture of a checkerboard, and it reads your brain's patterns to see what its reaction to that image is. The next step is to try and write that information to your brain so that you see the checkerboard without actually having seen it. This is a simple example. Once they've got this figured, then it'll get more elaborate super fast. The big question is, what will this enable us to do? And I think that is the big question that people are trying to figure out right now. It's difficult to speculate about its possibilities having not used the device, but let's discuss video games since we all have a good understanding of them already. Brain-computer interfacing would enable you to control them without needing a physical input device. You'd have better reflexes because it's reading directly from your brain instead of waiting for your hands to input an action. It could be used to simulate sights, sounds, smells even, sensations maybe. But even this feels like it's underselling what a direct link to the brain has the potential to be used for. Yes, it enables new possibilities for video games, but it enables new possibilities for everything. It would be great for people with disabilities. The message I got from the interview is that we're all effectively disabled compared with what somebody using this technology could do. So I think, really, we first need to get our minds around what our minds could do with this technology. He says Deus Ex-like augmentations and arm upgrades are less feasible than a Matrix-like reality, simply because there's more demand for the latter. Like, why limit this technology to augmenting reality when it could instead be used to create a whole new reality with its own rules? We need to start thinking with portals here. He says that it can change every facet of human life. How we buy products, how we drive, how surgeries are performed, and where. It would have great use in the military, effectively giving people superhuman abilities like being able to coordinate swarms of drones. He basically says that anybody using this technology will accelerate away from the rest of humanity. When he says it combines the strengths of computing and the human brain, it sounds almost like what they want from the human side of things is to be able to map out what our consciousness is. He thinks this will come before proper artificial intelligence does, but says that they're both approaching, share similarities, and once one of them arrives, the other will shortly follow. He explains that technology in the future is going to look less like hardware and more like biology, to the point where there's no longer a dividing line between the two things. It really sounds like this is the technology that could eventually render our brains redundant, and as being the thing that's currently holding us back, if there's even much need for us anymore once this takes off. He mentions that technology is already rendering people obsolete. The army has a minimum IQ requirement of 84. If you have an IQ below that, you're screwed. And don't look so smug, those of you with an IQ of 85, because that requirement's only going to increase as machines get smarter. Rightly or wrongly, people are already replacing experts with a Google search, but ultimately, we're all at risk of losing our jobs and uses from this, and by the time we realise what's going on, it could already be too late. Which again, is why we should be talking about this right now, even if it does sound like far-fetched sci-fi stuff at the moment. But it's coming. Gray implies that he knows more about it than he's able to speak about, but if progress carries on as it was when he gave this interview in 2019, he gives a rough timeline of five years for human prototypes and marketable prototypes within ten. That's before the year 2030. But this can't just get rolled out, it will need medical approval. He does briefly mention how there will be failsafes to prevent it from killing people or from turning them into potatoes, and says that some people will try to use this for malicious purposes, like to steal information or to plant viruses in brains. But as you can imagine, this is all wild speculation and it's far too soon to know the specifics. Can this change who you are? Well, yes it could, but that's understating its potential as well. It will enable you to live free of your physical constraints, giving you control over the chemical balance of your brain and even removing that aspect from your intelligence entirely. Again, saying that it could change you is underthinking it. 
He worries about what the top 1% of the 1% could do with this technology, or what companies could do if they're given free reign to experiment with it. It effectively gives people hacks, and it benefits the companies not to discuss this since that would result in more awareness and competition. He's hoping that companies will go open source and to start talking about what they're going to be doing, saying that Elon has done this with his car driving tech, so hopefully he'll do the same with this too. He hopes it doesn't get to the stage where the government has to get involved because they do a terrible job of that, but it may be necessary in this instance. In conclusion, we need to talk about this. This is a big technology that's speeding towards us, and we're far from being ready to deal with it, or to cope with its far-reaching and seemingly limitless implications. Towards the end of the interview, it takes a turn towards the more light-hearted again. Gray mentions that he's been playing The Witcher 3 lately in various Switch games. He talks about wanting to develop smaller games to keep his company afloat as he works towards the big game. He even discusses the soups available at the Valve offices. I personally find it terrifying that he can so casually talk about what sounds like the end of the world as we know it, before jumping straight back into discussing his favourite Smash Bros character. I guess, in a way, I'm jealous that he's on the forefront of emerging technologies, and that he has access to all sorts of information and technology that we're going to have to wait a bit longer before we get our hands on. The whole video is fascinating, and I strongly recommend you check it out. The two years since its release have only made it more interesting.